Okay, so today we're going to do a talk about frameworks. What could it hurt? And I, I like what could it hurt because this is something I hear quite often with my daughters, right? Like they want to try something new and I'm always like, great. And my wife's like, you sure? <laughs> I don't know. What could it hurt? But this is based on my testing. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a bunch of things. There's a few things I need to warn you about before we get started. One, I suck at public speaking. So sorry if you all picked wrong. Two, I am full of tangents. I will try to make my tangents relevant, but I don't promise, and my eyes are brown. I'm full of lots of things. Three, I have a sense of humor. Now, I want to be clear. Some of you heard I have a good sense of humor. That is not what I said. What I said was I have a sense of humor. For example, my current favorite joke is, do you know why Walmart wasn't hacked? They're not a target. <laughs> See? A sense of humor. I got to introduce the CISO of Walmart once at an event, and I told that joke, and he wouldn't shake my hand. And I'm thinking to myself, wait, you got the good side of the joke. I said you weren't hacked. Wait, like, man. OK, so that's what we're going to do. A little bit about myself. I am the founder and CEO, which means head nerd, of Secure Ideas. We are a consulting firm out of Jacksonville, Florida. Now, I want to be very clear. Our consulting is almost exclusively red teaming. We do pen testing, adversarial testing, red, red teaming, hunt teaming, what, blah, 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 right? That's what we do. The reason I bring this up is because it impacts my perspective, right? Like, a lot of people, we'll talk about the Equifax breach, right? A lot of people thought the Equifax breach, and they went, oh my god, that's horrible. I heard about the Equifax breach, and I thought to myself, oh my god, that's awesome, how'd they get in? Right, uh, slight skewness, right? Uh, we have this problem every once in a while, we'll be talking to our customers about the test, and the customer will be like, how's the test going? And I'll be like, oh, it's going great. And they'll be like, so we're secure? Oh no, I'm sorry, it's going great for me, you suck. <laughs> I'm having a blast. But that, so that perspective is going to come out as we talk over the next 45, 55 minutes, right? Uh, a couple other things. I'm an IONS faculty member, right? Uh, IONS is a great organization. I have to say that because Charlie's in the room. Uh, <laughs> no, actually it is. It's awesome. I'm amazed. They have 50 plus of the world class experts and me as faculty. Uh, so, and they do lots of cool things. I'm an OWASP chapter lead in Jacksonville. I run a bunch of open source projects. Some of you may know of them. Uh, Samurai WTF, which just released the latest version, 4.0. Its 10th anniversary is this year, uh, which is mind boggling to me. Uh, I run about 16 open source projects. I'm a nerd, uh, plain and simple. If you didn't know it before, you will by the end of this talk. I am so nerdy that the guy who used to steal my lunch money every day still takes it on a regular basis. But he makes a damn good Subway sandwich. <laughs> and then the final thing I'll talk about, which is something I'm very proud of, uh, all seriousness, I'm very proud of this, uh, I'm a member of the 501st Legion. For the people who don't know, we are a Star Wars costuming group that raises money for charity. Uh, last numbers I looked at, we had raised $11 million worldwide for various charities. We go and dress up in Star Wars costumes uh, and visit kids in the hospital. We do, so like I did a 5K in my Imperial Guard costume. I will be visiting December 1st. I'll be at Wolfson's Children's Hospital handing out toys to the kids there that are in the cancer ward and whatever. Uh, if you look at the pictures here, that's me in costume. The Vader one there was a blind children's event. They brought 300 blind kids in, had them watch the movies, which I, 
I'm not joking, I thought this was interesting that they referred to it as watching the movie, right? And then we spent three hours standing in costume while they felt our costumes so that they would know what the characters look like. All honesty, I'm crying in that armor, right? Now I will say that I found out yesterday that I present wrong because these are the only pictures of me in the entire presentation. But we know that breaches are happening constantly, right? And this, this bothers me. Now, I, I will talk about, you know, hey man, this is awesome, this cool hack, all that kind of stuff. But the reality is that every day we are finding out about another breach, another exploit. And we as the security community, I don't mean to be rude, but we suck, right? We are full of victim blaming. We are full of, well, that's not how I would do it. Let me ask you a question. How many people here believe their systems are secure? Good. I'm glad nobody's hand went up because we'd have to heckle you. We have a problem and we see it every day. When organizations like Equifax, because we may make fun of them, I mean, they're an easy target. They're an easy company to hate. They collect data about us and then use it against us. And if we want to see it, we have to pay them. Who the hell comes up with that kind of business model except for the mob, right? But they have lots of money and yet they failed. And their failure, which we'll talk about more, according to what was publicly released, and I want to be very clear, not a customer, wasn't part of the breach investigation, so I don't know, but I will talk based on what I understand from the public reports, right? If they can't do it right, if the National Security Agency, it's in their damn name, can't do it right, how do we expect Joe Schmo Community College or Wolfson's Children's Hospital or Jack and Jill's Candy Store to get it right, right? And yet they have to, because I'll tell you right now, my oldest, Brenna, who is 16, when she was nine, was diagnosed with OCD and a seizure disorder that she'll outgrow. And three months later, we got the letter that her data had been breached because Wolfson's Children's Hospital had a problem. And so my nine-year-old daughter, who is now 16, for the rest of her life is going to have to deal with the fear of identity theft because of mistakes we made. That was not a comfortable conversation for me to have. That was not a fun conversation for me to have, especially with what I do for a living, right? Her social security number is Googleable right now. And that was actually helpful when she got her learner's permit because my wife and I could not find the card. So we Google searched it and got her social security number so we could fill in the form. So it was helpful, but, right? So we see these problems with the breaches and everything else like that. And what it boils down to is that the second most common vulnerability we see that causes breaches are problems in our applications. We all know that the first one is users, right? Users suck. We can stand up here and talk about the fact that we can socially engineer people trivially. I own a FedEx uniform. I bought it for $40 on eBay and UPS delivered it, which I thought was fun, right? I mean, that's, that's what we do. Users fall for things all the time. Hell, we were testing this one organization. I know, slight tangent, I told you I would do them, right? We sent out a social engineering attack against an organization that basically said, due to Trump's election, not getting political, just it was relevant, open enrollment has moved up to this week instead of next week. And we signed the name of the HR rep for the company, the head of HR. We sent it out to the entire staff. 98% of the staff clicked the link and gave us their credentials to enroll for benefits, including the head of HR. Open enrollment wasn't for six months. You would think she would know that. She was pissed. 
But we know that users are our first problem. That's not today's talk. We can talk about that if you want. I'll be at the chuck wagon thing. We can hang out and make fun of users. The rest of them, most of them, are problems with our applications, right? And the problem is, and, and don't get me wrong, we can sit here and we can say, oh man, developers suck, right? How many people have heard that? How many people have heard security say, our problem is our developers suck, right? Yeah. How many people in the room are a developer? Because I am, and I'll admit I suck. But here's the reality. For the people who raised their hand, I'll pick on you, sir. Sorry, you raised your hand, you're right there, the beard, right? Okay, you're a Target. Do you, do you work for a Target? <laughs> Why would you name your company after something people shoot at? I don't understand that. That's kind of like, you know the MDM provider, good technology? Why are they not better technology? Like, I'm going to start a company. We're going to have a crap product, but we're going to be best technology. And then that way, you know, when we're up for an RFP, I'll be like, well, who would you go with? Good or best? Right? But, total tangent. When we talk as developers, right, how many times have you been given a project where your management has said to you, how long will this take to build? Right? And you come back and go, ah, damn, probably three months. Right? And they come back and go, you got three weeks. Why'd you ask? Well, we already have people who want to buy it, so we need it very fast. Okay, I can build it in three weeks if four-eighths of it, I know that's a half, math, <laughs> it sucks. It's a good thing we homeschool our kids. But <laughs> we do actually homeschool our kids. Do you know how expensive school lockers are? because I priced them because I decided if we were going to homeschool, they needed to have a bully and I would fulfill that, right? And so I was going to buy a school locker to shove my kids into it, but they were too expensive for the joke. But we see all of this software development, right? And we say to developers, hey, we, this is simple. And we actually have had a problem that we have changed the idea of development from a skilled technology, right? Like, you've got to be trained. You have to know this stuff to the point where now Barack Obama is a developer. And I'm not like, I, it's Barack Obama's fault. Thanks, Obama. That's not what I'm saying. But remember when we had the, like, hour of code and President Obama sat down and wrote JavaScript? And they made a big deal about he was now a developer. And I'm not trying to insult our previous president, right? But I got a feeling he's not a developer. But we've presented development as this trivial exercise, something that anybody can do. You take an hour, you can learn it, it'll be fine, right? There are even books, PHP in 21 seconds or something, right? And we show it as some, well, you know, you sign up for Pluralsight, you pay, what is it, I don't know, $30 a month for a subscription, you watch some videos, and you're gonna get a $400,000 a year job as a developer. It's awesome. I know you're sitting there thinking, not me. <laughs> yeah. you're, you're working at the wrong place, but so am I, okay? <laughs> we show it as easy. And when we talk to organizations, what we find is that most of them are under this misconception. We talk to uh, managers and uh, the C-level executives, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't they just plug some stuff together and write some code or something and we have an app? Well, yeah. And what we've seen is this huge move to frameworks, which is what we'll talk about in a second. But what has happened is we were actually making good progress, in my opinion, of getting developers to understand that security was important. That it wasn't the afterthought that so many people think it is. <coughs> we've gotta build it in, we've gotta start it early, right? But what we have is we went down a path. And, and don't get me wrong, OWASP and NIST likes this path. I like this path. Because when I first started pen testing applications, when I started really focusing on web applications and mobile applications and, and hacking them, it was simple. I mean, I'd like you all to believe that I'm like a wizard 
when it comes to application security, right? Like I have the, the cool skills and I'm a genius because I can do this. But the reality is what I do is glorified quality assurance. I'm a QA tester. The only difference between me and an actual QA tester is what I do with the results, right? A QA person, they poke at the app. Poke, 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 oh, that broke. And when they find the, oh, that broke, they write a bug report. They file it for the developers to fix it. Oh, hey, I put a single quote in this field and I got a database error message. That's probably not what we want. So you might want to fix that. And then they move on. When I poke and I get that database error message, or whatever it is, I giggle. I giggle a lot in my job. And then I determine what I can do next. Can I pivot? Can I steal data? Can I become somebody else? Can I change what I'm doing, right? That's the difference. And when we were first testing apps, we were finding stuff, oh my god, it was awful. Everything was vulnerable. I could put a script tag in a search field and have a pop-up. I could put a single quote in pretty much any field on the internet and dump all the data. I know it doesn't work that way, but go with it, right? And we always used to complain, oh my god, you know why that is? That guy wrote crappy code. That guy wrote even worse code. And we kept blaming everybody. Yeah, I know, I've seen your code, man. Yeah, you know I'm right. Yeah. What's worse, the only person who's written worse code than you? Me. <laughs> ah. So, what we started pushing was this idea of frameworks. Instead of him, i sorry man, I don't even know your name. Right, like a, that guy. Adam, right? Oh, first man, that's why your code was so bad. Don't eat the apple. But, we would say that the right answer was to stop letting Adam build all of his own code. Sorry, man, now you're in, right? I, totally. Yeah, you better get credit on this video on YouTube, right? Yeah, but, <laughs> go on his resume. I was the heckle target of Kevin. But, <laughs> instead of letting Adam write his own code, what we said was, Adam, take some of these frameworks and leverage them. Let those frameworks do the heavy lifting so you can build the business logic, the, the sensitive stuff that we have. You don't need to build your own session management. We've got it for you. We don't need to build database interaction. We got it for you. And let's be clear, that was good. That was what we wanted. We didn't, then all joking aside, it's not because Adam is a functional idiot. He may be, right. But it's because we want him to focus on building the parts of the application that are specific to our organization, right? Don't waste his time and our money on him building stuff somebody else has already built well before. So let's use frameworks. And that was good. But here's what I've realized. This is where I get to say, mea culpa. Because we left off, and I, I'll take the blame with anybody else, because I'm one of those security people that pushed for this. But we left off a piece. We left off that when Adam was using that framework, we needed Adam to understand what the framework did. We needed him to understand how it worked and what it was doing when he was using it. Because those efficiencies, right, that heavy lifting being done for you is good. <clears throat> but then what we have is a lack of understanding, which is what the graphic is. Everybody, how many people here recognize the graphic that's on the screen? It's awesome, isn't it? So for the people who don't understand this, in 1979, I want to say in Oregon? I want to say it was Oregon. It might have been Washington State, but Oregon, you're nodding? Yeah, it was somewhere, you know, some of those Northwest liberals, whatever. But um, a dead whale washed ashore, okay? It 
came up on the shoreline, and it was like, I don't know, 20 tons of dead whale, okay? And the city's like, shit. <laughs> what do we do about the whale? And they hired an engineer from the Army Corps of Civil Engineering, which you would think, right? Dude's got the iron ring. He's smart. So they say to him, how do we get rid of this whale? The heavy lifting. And he said, oh, it's easy. Dynamite. <laughs> and he got, I think the number was 200 cases of dynamite. And his plan was that he would shove all of this dynamite in the whale's ass. Maybe not exactly. <laughs> and he was going to blow it up. And in his engineering design, the whale would vaporize. And it would be gone. And people said to him, are you sure? And he's like, yes. And it may not completely vaporize. There may be small pieces of whale guts that are left. But that's OK, because the seagulls and the crabs will eat the whale guts that remain, and we won't have a dead whale on the shore of Oregon, right? So this is the problem. We've built these frameworks. Let's call struts 200 pounds of dynamite. <laughs> I don't know. We'll make it relevant, <laughs> right? And we have these frameworks do all the heavy lifting, and that's good because they'll deal with stuff like CSRF tokens and SQL injection prevention and open redirection validators and blah, 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 right? And all of that is great until you start actually implementing them. And what we see is that people will implement the frameworks without truly understanding how they work. Django is a good one. How many people here have played with Django? It's a Python framework, right? You can use it. It does. I like it. It works really well. I mean, it's not Ruby, so that's awesome, all right? By the way, I just want to be clear. I don't fight any religious wars. The only religious war I will argue with you about is VI versus Emacs, and that's because we all know VI wins, right? Yeah. Now, you all applaud. I said that in class one day. I'm like, VI wins. And this guy back in the room is like, Mrah! Bam! And he punched the desk, stood up, and stormed out of the room. And I'm like, shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. PG-13, right? Okay. But um, about 45 minutes later, he walked back into the room. I'm like, dude, you okay? I say dude way too often for somebody who doesn't surf. But I'm like, dude, you okay? Turns out he was one of the original Emacs developers. I didn't know what to say. So I said, dude, Emacs is an awesome operating system. He didn't like that much either. But Django is supposed to handle all these protections for you, right? Except their XSS protection is trivial to bypass. For, it's been fixed in many ways. It's gotten better. But for a while there, all you had to do was use capital letters in the script tag, and it bypassed the validator. Because you know, capital script is totally different than lowercase script. Right? They also had open redirects. Like, by default, if you use the Django framework, it was vulnerable to an open redirect vulnerability, which meant that I could send somebody to your site, and when they were done there, automatically redirect them to my site. And let's be clear, where I'm redirecting them to is exploits.professionalevil.com slash something. Right? By the way, don't go to exploits.professionalevil.com. It does exactly what it says. Um, that's an open redirect, right? That's a problem. Heck, it had hard-coded passwords. <clears throat> You've built a framework that is supposed to handle security, and you hard-coded a password. My 12-year-old doesn't make that mistake anymore, right? I mean, that, that's a, I believe that any company that releases software with hard-coded passwords, we should be allowed to punch every one of their salespeople in the throat. Right? I, I think we would get better security of that. Like, did you sell me this product? Pop and see what, that, see what happens. I bet you security would get better. But struts, this was a great one. Struts was vulnerable to a deserialization object flaw. 
Now, for the people who don't know, serialization is actually a really important part of any object-oriented language, right? Because you have these objects that you have to be able to pass back and forth in various ways. And so what you do is you serialize them. You basically, con and I know the computer science majors in the room will cringe in a second. I barely made it out of high school. But we serialize it, basically convert it into a string to be able to pass it safely back and forth. But here's the problem. When we accept it back, we have to deserialize it. So we bring it back into that object format. And if when we bring it back into that object format, we don't do that safely, we run the risk of the attacker being able to inject into that string commands or exploits that we would inadvertently run it during the deserialization. That's a deserialization flaw. In very simplistic language, right? But now we have a problem, right? We have this framework that the application is built around. This is what hit Equifax, by the way. They were running a struts application. Let's ignore the jackass that went in front of Congress and said, there's this one guy that was responsible for patching and he didn't do his job. Ah, it's John Strand. The man's awesome. That guy lied. I know, I know. Surprise. Somebody lied to Congress. I think it's only fair Congress lies to us. But the reality is, when you build your application using struts, you build it to a certain version of struts. If you want to patch struts, in most cases, in all cases, you have to recompile your app. But in most cases, you also have to change your code to call struts differently because the framework has changed. So not only do you have to build out a new release, but you have to make sure that everything is regression tested, right? This is not a Windows patch. It takes time. And I'm not going to say how much time, because that depends on the app, the development cycle, how long it takes them to push something to production. Here's what Equifax did. They knew they had the flaw. They also knew they could not patch the flaw fast enough to prevent the attack. So they built a web app firewall rule to block the attack. The attacker figured out a way around the rule. Now, I don't mean to be rude, because like I told you, I'm willing to hate on Equifax just like the rest of you if you want. The only people I'm willing to hate on more is Comcast. The reality is they tried to prevent that flaw. But the developers had used a framework without understanding what that framework provided and what it didn't provide. So we have allowed the atoms of the world. Yeah, he was coming back. You knew, right? We've gone to Adam, and we've pushed him on the idea of using frameworks. We've also encouraged the idea that what Adam does isn't hard. So now what we've done is we've cut the resources Adam needs to the point where he has to build code as fast as possible. And in most cases, even if he wants to pay attention, he doesn't have the time to figure out what the framework is actually doing. He learns it, he runs with it, he deploys it to production. Because that's what he's got time for. Not because he's an idiot. Not because he doesn't care about security, but because we have allowed our organizations and the public to believe that frameworks solve all the problems. And that simply isn't true. Because here's what goes on. And I run into this all the time. I deal with these frameworks on a regular basis. I've got a customer. They are, they're a good customer. I like them. And they use Ruby on Rails. They are obsessed with the idea that Ruby on Rails solves every one of their problems. We do, on a regular basis, what we refer to as an architecture review with them. We send some consultants on site. We sit down with the developers. We walk through what they're doing and how they're doing it. And then we give them feedback on what we think they should do. And we had one of their developers, which I'll admit did not work there long, because he, unlike Adam, was actually an idiot. See, that I complimented him. Right? Yeah. 
This guy said to us that because he used Ruby on Rails, his application was invulnerable to SQL injection. It was impossible to perform SQL injection attacks against his site because it was using Ruby on Rails. He was an idiot. What he was mistaken on is Ruby on Rails uses something called active record. It is an abstraction layer for database queries. But it is really doing dynamic SQL behind the scenes. Dynamic SQL, as we all know, I'm assuming, is basically the reason SQL injection works. It's because the application is dynamically creating the query based on input from the user, right? So what Ruby on Rails does it is it abstracts that dynamic SQL so the developer can't see it. What the developer sees are these active record queries. Now here's the great thing. We can inject active record query strings just as easily as we inject SQL injection strings. The only difference is we write them different. They do the exact same thing. Active record then converts our payload into the SQL query we were trying to control. It is so easy that there is a website called rubysqli.org, that the entire website is just a list of payloads to attack Ruby on Rails sites for SQL injection. That's how easy this is. So I say to the developer, you can't prevent SQL injection just by saying, we use Ruby on Rails, we're safe. That's like saying my alarm works because I believe it's on. I haven't checked, but I think my wife hit armed as we walked out the door, right? That's not the same, that doesn't work, right? So this developer argued with us, and let's be clear, I am wrong a lot. I am, I'm an idiot, I'm not that smart. If I was, I would never agree to stand up on stage. I'd be like, screw that, hippie. <laughs> and, uh, but I keep falling for it and getting up here. But I'm not that smart of a guy. So I recognize the fact that I'm wrong a lot. And so I research and I look. And you'll hear me say things like, I believe this is true. And then we can go find out. So I didn't tell this guy he was an idiot. He was. I didn't tell this guy your app is vulnerable. What I told him was that active record is not a protection in and of itself you still have to filter, you still have to deal with what you're doing. And as a matter of fact, what you should be using is parameterized queries, but we can go into that later. Period, parameterized queries. And the guy said, I think you're wrong. I'm like, yeah, so does my wife. And he's like, well, I have an app. Will you test it? I'm like, yeah, sure. It took us, and like I said, I'm not that smart. It took us about 45 seconds to find the first SQL injection flaw in his system, right? And we literally went out to SQL, rubysqli.org. No, I'm sorry, it's railssqli. I lied to you guys. It's railssqli.org, I'm sorry. We went out there, we grabbed a single payload and put it in the first parameter we could find. And we dumped data. <laughs> that simple. Like that. Like I said, doesn't take a genius, right? You fire up burp, you intercept the traffic, you change the payload, you send it on, you dump data, you're done. Ta-da, you're vulnerable. That's how easy this is. That's what we find. On the client side, we're removing so much stuff there, right? More and more apps, oh hey, it's a single page app, it's gonna be awesome. Right? I love single page apps. I really do. One, as a user, I like them because they're interactive and I get to do what I need to do. Two, as a hacker, I love them because you took all the client, the business logic and you put it in my browser. <coughs> that was a mistake. My browser is not a place any of your logic should function because my browser is my browser. I get to play with it. jQuery is a great library to handle a lot of the interactivity, the dynamicity, I made up that word, right, of your system. And <clears throat> people deploy it constantly. But what they do is they grab a specific version, they put it in their app, and they never look at it again. 
There are 87 billion vulnerabilities in jQuery. I may be exaggerating slightly. And here's the best part. You have to go fix them. <laughs> you actually have to use the new version of the library. And again, like struts, you have to recode your JavaScript to handle the new version of the library, right? So you have to upgrade and redeploy and test it out and verify that everything works. Now, some of you may be tempted, I'm looking at you, Adam, <laughs> to use jQuery migrate. Because it's actually, the jQuery people woke up one day, I, this is how I picture it, right? They all woke up and went, hey, I have an idea. Let's build a library that pretends to the code that our developer wrote that they're talking to the same version of jQuery they used to talk to, and the library will convert the requests to the way the new version of jQuery uses. Here's the best part of that. You upgrade jQuery, you install jQuery Migrate, you still have the same vulnerabilities the old version has. Because all of the vulnerabilities in jQuery were how you called the libraries. So jQuery Migrate, you call them the same way. You fixed nothing. This is the problem. Every single thing I've talked about, all of the stories and everything else I've looked at, the problem is not that you did something stupid. The problem is you used something that you thought made you safer, but actually made you more vulnerable. It would be like if we gave every police officer a water gun, but didn't tell them it was a water gun. They would go out thinking they were safer, right? They would say, hey, I'm armed, I can handle this, right? But they got a water gun. That's not gonna help them, right? That's what we've done with developers. We've said to developers, here is an iron safe. This will protect all of your data if you use this framework. But it doesn't. It's like the whale. You knew I was getting back to it. They finally exploded the 200 pounds of dynamite, or 200 boxes of dynamite. Let's be clear, there was another engineer that came out and said, 200 pounds of dynamite, way too much. You don't need that much. If you put like four cases of dynamite in that whale, it will vaporize. So they exploded it. You can't see it here, but pieces as large as eight feet wide landed as far as two miles away from the shore. And I don't mean toward the ocean. <laughs> they blew the whale at the city. <laughs> they crushed cars. To this day, they still don't know how nobody was killed. Like chunks of whale rained down on this small beachside town. Now, the urban, I don't know that this is true, but I want it to be true. There are pictures of this brand new Buick that was parked that had like an eight foot piece of whale blubber crushing the car. The urban legend is that car was the civil engineer's car that he had just bought. I don't know that that's true, but I want it to be true, right? They end, you know that part about the seagulls and the crabs cleaning up the whale pieces that were left? The 200 boxes of dynamite scared the wildlife so badly that it was two months before they saw a seagull in that area. Like all the animals went, fuck that noise, and left. But like, that's it. Now I bring this up, not just because I love the exploding whale story, which by the way, if you go out to Google, the news video where you can literally hear the whale chunks dropping on the ground it's hilarious. I almost peed myself the first time I watched this video. It was great. Like, so other than the fact that I just love this video and want to share it with all of you, this is exactly what we see with our development. We get a developer, Adam. You have all seen Adam. The guy looks like a genius. He looks like a developer, right? He's got the beard. I mean, it's not a neck beard. That's good. Right, a little bit of a neck beard? Okay, a little bit of a neck beard. But he looks like a developer. We trust him because he knows languages we don't. He can say things like Erlang and Golang and not laugh. And he pretends 
not judging, <laughs> that he knows more than we do. And so when he says, the answer is, we'll use Ruby on Rails combined with struts and put jQuery on top. I know, you're thinking about it, right? And you laugh. I actually pen tested an app that the app was written in ColdFusion, JSP, and ASP.NET. Because there were three architects that designed it, and they couldn't decide on a language. So all three of them were responsible for pieces of the app. And they wrote in completely different languages. I'm sorry? Oh, web, I love web services. And you know the rule, right? If a pen test server says they like something, get it off your network. I love SharePoint. But we trust the engineer to know how much dynamite to vaporize the whale. We trust the developer to know what frameworks to use to protect them. But I'll bet you, and I don't know, because while I was alive in 1979, I wasn't hanging out in an Oregon town with dead whales. I will bet you that he was asked how to get rid of it, and he had a solution that would have actually worked, just like Adam's solution would actually work. But the town didn't want to spend that much money. They wouldn't want to dedicate that many resources to deal with it, and so they asked for the smaller one, and then got mad when the whale guts rained down. The developer has a resume generating event every time the application gets hacked, right? An RGE happens because it's his fault or her fault that the app wasn't built correctly when most of the time it's we didn't give them the resources they need. Now, I'm not recommending that we just open the wallets and let Adam spend whatever he wants. I am saying, though, that we need to understand what they're doing and we need to ensure that they understand how they're handling things. But until we get there, we are still gonna have these vulnerabilities. We are still gonna have these problems. And as much as I love what I do, as much as I love being able to talk about hacking this and hacking that, the reality is my goal in life, my business goal is to go out of business. If I do my job right, you don't need me. Now, Wells Fargo who holds my mortgage is not worried about that happening anytime soon. Right? So that's my talk. I want to give you two more things, if you don't mind. I'm going to do a sales pitch for two things. It's the only sales pitch I'm going to do today. The first sales pitch, if you are a veteran, active duty military, or first responder, Secure Ideas is training online is 100% free. You reach out to us, we'll give you a coupon code to register for all of our training online for free. Our live classes are either free or significantly reduced for veterans, active duty military, and first responders. The only difference will be if we're paying per seat to host the class, we have to pass some of that cost on to the student, right? That's the only reason it's not always free. That's the first sales pitch. So if you're a vet, active duty military, first responder, reach out to me, ask, our training is free, okay? That's first sales pitch. Second sales pitch. If you work with or deal with a charitable nonprofit organization, please notice I said charitable and nonprofit, not just nonprofit. I had a nonprofit that had like a billion dollar budget ask me for this. Secure Ideas services are free for that charitable nonprofit. And when I say free, I don't mean free for six months and then we hit them with a big bill. They're free. The only qualifiers to that is, one, they have to be able to sign a zero dollar contract because all of my insurances are predicated on contracts. And two, the charitable nonprofit has to be approved by me. Now, you may ask what kind of charities I approve. It's easier to tell you what kind of charities I don't approve. The polite way to say it, I don't approve charities that are jerks. I'll give you an example of one. Westboro Baptist Church, those jackasses that protest funerals, the federal government considers them a charitable nonprofit. 
I'm not going to give them services. So don't be a dick charity and our services are free, okay? So if you know them, please reach out. I'm Kevin at secureideas.com. Email me, call me, whatever it takes. We'll help you out because our job, all of us, is to be responsible for security and help everybody out there get better at protecting their stuff. Make sense? There you go, guys. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the show.